Before we begin today's episode, I would like to give a massive thanks to Capcom for providing me early access to the Apollo Justice Ace Attorney Trilogy Collection. They sent me a package with an objection pin, an Apollo Trilogy notepad, and a t-shirt alongside a Nintendo Switch early access code to the collection. It was pretty fortunate timing because I was already going to make my first video this year, a review of Apollo Justice 1, but I worked it out so that I could do both a brief, spoiler-free review on the collection and my in-depth thoughts on the Apollo Justice game in the same video. So if you want to see the collection, that's coming up right now, but if you just want to see Apollo Justice, then skip to this timestamp to hear all about it. With that said, let's get into the show. It's great to see the Ace Attorney series get as much love as it has been getting lately. We first got the HD edition of the Phoenix Wright trilogy in 2019, which quickly became the definitive way to experience the trilogy and brought in a lot of new fans for the series. In 2021, we got the great Ace Attorney games in a collection that were previously Japanese exclusives, and now we have the Apollo Justice Ace Attorney trilogy. In it, you get Apollo Justice Ace Attorney, which first came out on the DS in 2007, starring rookie attorney Apollo Justice being navigated by Phoenix Wright in a plan to uncover the truth behind one of the biggest scandals in the series' history. But in addition to that, you get Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney Dual Destinies, which came out in the 3DS in 2013, which saw the titular character return to the law properly alongside Apollo and a new character, Athena Sykes, as they attempt to resolve the Dark Age of the Law and restore it to its former glory. And finally, you get Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney Spirit of Justice, another 3DS game from 2016 where Phoenix travels to the Kingdom of Kurayan and gets mixed in with the ongoing legal revolution against the Queen's dictatorship, and Apollo also gets roped into it by the end. Now sure, you can poke fun at the fact that the Apollo Justice trilogy has two games that don't even bear his name, but I think it's an appropriate classification for this saga of the series as he and his story are a large focus in each one. But there's more to the collection than just the games themselves. I think this compilation was definitely a step up from the Wright Trilogy pack in terms of options and menus and extra features. If all you want is the games, you have them, but I mean to say that I thought it was really cool how you can customize how the menus look for each game. My preference was the wallpaper that resembled the four character profiles that the Ace Attorney series always used for the cover art of the games. You get a full menu of extras like a music library for these iconic soundtracks, an animation viewer, an art gallery for each of the games where you can watch the FMV cutscenes and see other artwork from each game. If you've played these games before, a handy feature is that you can either start a new game or you can just load up the individual sections from each case to revisit your favorite parts, which is definitely handy in capturing footage for sure. In terms of the conversion quality, just like the other games, this is without a doubt the definitive way to play these games going forward. Apollo Justice, originally being a sprite-based game on the DS, looks really clean in the new version. It just looks like they brought the original artwork straight into the new version and it looks really crisp. Updating certain assets as well, like these zoomed out character shots to look more detailed. The UI across all three games are consistent and looks really sleek as well, which helps because Dual Destinies is obviously a much different style from Apollo. On the 3DS, the developers were able to switch to 3D models for these games and they've been upscaled into HD really naturally, and that's coming from someone who played it on the Switch and not my PC where it would have been even crisper. The animated cutscenes that were once really compressed to fit onto the 3DS are in their original quality too, which is a really nice thing as you can make out extra details in the scenes you would have missed through the layer of pixels brought on the original hardware. Both Dual Destinies and Spirit of Justice feature all five cases from the original game, but also the DLC from those games at no extra cost. This means the extra costumes and the DLC cases, Turnabout Reclaimed from Dual Destinies, and Turnabout Time Traveler from Spirit of Justice. And you get an abundance of options like the transparency on the text boxes, the speed that the text goes at if you have skip text enabled, an autoplay feature if you want to see the story without having to figure out the contradictions, and a readily accessible save and load feature. All this is to say that I believe if you're an Ace Attorney fan, this collection is an easy must-buy. With it, you get three games that are often slept on in comparison to the Phoenix Wright trilogy that I think are really good at the end of the day. Well, I never actually played Dual Destinies before, I just ended up skipping that one and got around to Spirit of Justice later, so I can't really speak on that one, even if I'm familiar with the basic beats of the game and its story. But regardless, this was a really high-quality compilation of games that are all worth playing. If you like endearing characters and mystery solving, the Apollo Justice trilogy will certainly scratch that itch and then some. This is definitely the definitive version of these games for me going forward. It's kind of crazy that we now live in a world where almost the entire Ace Attorney franchise, which used to just be on Nintendo handhelds, are now widely available on just about every platform. Now all we need is a collection of the Miles Edgeworth games and get the second one officially translated for the first time, which really isn't that preposterous anymore given the fact that we got the great Ace Attorney games a few years back. I'd also love to see a re-release of Professor Layton vs. Phoenix Wright, too. I thought that game was awesome, but I'm not sure if that'll happen or not. Time will tell. But in the present day, it's nice that we have a collection of these games that's easy to play and replay in the future. And also, it is huge that the Switch version of the trilogy is getting a physical copy in the West. 
Dual Destinies and Spirit of Justice were digital only in the West, so this is also really nice for making sure people have easy access to these games in the future. But that's really all I have to say about the collection itself without any spoilers. Like I said, this video is a double feature of the collection and the regular review of Apollo Justice that I was already going to do. So if you're just here for the collection and don't want any spoilers, you can take off now or you can proceed and get the real meat of the video. But now we're going back in time to the mid 2000s. You remember, right? The Phoenix Wright Trilogy were these neat games exclusive to the Game Boy Advance in Japan. With the release of the Nintendo DS, the game started to reach the West and thus the name Ace Attorney was born. The series creator, Shu Takumi, never intended for there to be more games in the series past the trilogy. In those games, Phoenix Wright rose up from a fresh off the bar attorney who needed guidance from his mentor at every turn and by the end was a capable intellectual powerhouse who could solve the most complex of cases. It was a fun story with lots of memorable characters, but obviously the Ace Attorney series went past trials and tribulations as now there are over 10 Ace Attorney games. What happened was that the higher ups still wanted Ace Attorney and thus Ace Attorney was going to keep getting made. Takumi was still in charge of writing this fourth installment, and he thought it was for the best for there to be a new protagonist, and thus Apollo Justice was invented. Although that cuts past the weeks and weeks of debating on what he should look like, sound like, and what his name should be, and the list goes on. Character creation is difficult stuff, but you get the point. The reason the video is titled the way it is stems from the fact that upon release in 2007-2008, depending on what region you're in, Apollo Justice Ace Attorney was met with favorable reception as critics thought it was another game that succeeded at all the same things the other Ace Attorney games did well, however it just didn't do much to improve issues like guesswork as the main method of progression. But still, the game got good scores and actually was the highest selling game in the Ace Attorney series prior to the Wright Trilogy being released in HD in 2019. That was the thing that had me the most surprised to learn, because Apollo Justice seems to be a lesser favorite amongst the fans. You don't really hear this game and its cases discussed much when fans go over the heights of the Ace Attorney series. The game itself, from my experience, is usually considered the most thoroughly okay one. I only played it once back in 2017, never really rewatched a lot of the moments like I did for the other games, but still, I have a lot of good memories playing this game back in 2017, staying up late like I did for Justice for All and Trials and Tribulations. I came out of the experience thinking this game was pretty strong, just not as good as the others. As the years have gone by, I look back on this game and think its story is really compelling when viewed from the bigger picture, so that's what I wanted to share in this video. Why I think Apollo Justice is actually really good and interesting, but also give my perspective on why it might not be remembered as fondly as the original trilogy. It all starts in Case 1, Turnabout Trump. Despite this game's reputation, this case is one people usually point to as one of the best tutorial cases they've ever done, and I'm certainly in agreement. The traveler, Shady Smith, has been killed over a game of poker in the basement of the Borscht Bowl Club. The accused is Phoenix Wright, who's requested representation by Apollo Justice, a rookie attorney at the Gavin Law Offices. It seems pretty familiar, right? That's what makes this case so great. It begins similarly to the first turnabout from the first Ace Attorney, or even turnabout memories from Trials and Tribulations. Especially that one, since you get a basic crime and are introduced to the new playable character and their mentor, and then you represent Phoenix Wright in a position we aren't used to seeing. Takumi created Phoenix Wright with his own personality traits, and on that note, I think Phoenix was enough of an everyman that every player could relate to him. Apollo was relatable enough as the main character, but he's fervent, whereas Phoenix Wright was more calm in demeanor. It helps Apollo stand out from the previous protagonist. Phoenix being the accused makes the game interesting from moment one, because it's been seven years since the end of the third game, and now Phoenix Wright is not an attorney anymore, and he plays piano and poker at the Borscht Bowl Club. I mean, what the hell happened to him? It already creates a game-wide mystery as it stated there was an incident at Phoenix's final trial that resulted in his being a member of the legal community no longer. But as I was saying, the first case starts off pretty by the numbers. Apollo is shown the ropes by his mentor, Christoph Gavin, one of the most talented defense attorneys in town who's also friends with Mr. Wright. You go through witness testimony trying to prove your client innocent, and they even play the tell the truth theme when Kristoff teaches Apollo and the player how to do a cross-examination, which is exactly how they did it when Mia taught Phoenix how to do that in the first game. By the 40 minute mark, it seems like it's about to end as Kristoff guides Apollo to blame the witness, but it really goes off script when Phoenix is about to be declared innocent, only for him to object and say that Gavin is the true guilty party. The second half of the case is what makes it so memorable for so many, as Phoenix now guides Apollo on how to reveal Kristoff as the true killer. It's just such a wild turn that you become glued to the action because they played in your expectations really well since you just never imagined this was going to happen since the guy is literally on the box and he's the killer of the first case. But it builds off of information you already had and could have realized, like when Phoenix points out how Kristoff claimed the cards used in the game had blue backs when at that point the only photo shown of the crime scene was black and white. How would he know such a thing? It's really suspenseful and nostalgic as when Phoenix joins your side, Objection 2001 from the first game plays in the background. Objection!
It's plenty exciting on its own merits, but this whole dilemma prompts one of the biggest narratives of the game, and that is the thing I find most compelling about it when reflecting on the game. That being the fact that this game does a proper interrogation of the entire legal structure of Ace Attorney. There's more to this in Cases 3 and 4, but in Case 1, Phoenix uses a bit of fake evidence by showing a bloodied card that causes Kristoff to freak out because it's fake. But Phoenix points out only the true killer could have known that because he removed the real one from the crime scene. Circumstantial evidence exposed the real killer when definitive evidence did not exist. When Phoenix reveals that it was fake and that he changed the scene of the crime to make Kristoff's statements contradictory, you start to wonder, who is this guy now, removed from his former glory? What really happened to Mr. Wright? Was it some forgery scandal like the rumors say? All things Apollo is wondering, which further makes the victory of Case 1 give off an uneasy vibe. After that, the game slows down much more in Case 2, Turnabout Corner. Cases 2 and 3 seem to be the ones where people think back on this game as kind of bland or boring, and I can see why, even though I like them. The crime itself rises to the level of intricacy that, say, Turnabout Big Top or Recipe for Turnabout had, though Turnabout Corner has an issue because it wants to have a complex series of events for Apollo to navigate through, but the first half of the case also has to introduce the cast of characters, like, say, Turnabout Sisters in the first game, which pulled that off by making the case really simple. It just makes the runtime of this case feel a bit long, as Apollo begrudgingly joins the Wright & Co. law offices that has now been named the Wright Anything Agency. The office is managed by Phoenix's 15-year-old daughter, a magician in training named Trucy, who becomes Apollo's assistant throughout the game. She bounces off his energy really well, as Apollo out of the courtroom can be kind of awkward and doesn't really pay much attention to what's going on besides the legal stuff, and Trucy is quirky and confident to a fault. They make a really good team because of it. But the world of Apollo Justice can be a bit of a cynical one at times, as Emma Skye from the first Ace Attorney is now the lead detective. And the gag is just that the teen girl full of ambition and drive to be a forensic investigator, nine years later, is a grumpy homicide detective who resents the fact that she didn't get the actual job she wanted. That could easily be kind of depressing, but they play it up enough to where it's pretty humorous at the same time. Through Emma, you get to witness many of the game's DS-centric gimmicks. Players got a taste of that in the Rise from the Ashes case in the first game, but this game has all that and then some. Fingerprint detection, toe print detection, x-ray scanning, mixing boards, and so on. I think all of that adds a nice bit of variety to the investigations as each case sees Apollo tinker with a different tool. Apollo's main superpower is that his bracelet allows him to perceive the small twitches in the witnesses on the stand. Although I always thought this ability was kind of a reach. It always felt like an unnatural way to catch witnesses by finding small movements they do that might illuminate things they're lying about. It's hard to describe for me, but I always felt like this was the kind of thing that would fall under the category of badgering the witness, even by Ace Attorney standards. Though I will say this, the concept art for it is really funny. As per usual with this series, Case 2 introduces the main prosecutor for the game. This time, it's the prosecutor by day, rock star by night, Clavier Gavin. Christoph Gavin's brother, who took a leave from the prosecutor's office to focus on his music career, has returned to see who Apollo Justice really is. I think Clavier is a perfect character in that he, like the role Kristoff played in Case 1, is an excellent subversion of your expectations. If you've played the trilogy, you're used to the routine. You'd get a new prosecutor with some defining gimmick like Franziska von Karma's arrival to whip up the courtroom or Godot with his mask and coffee addiction. Clavier Gavin being a rock star is obviously his defining gimmick, but there's a lot to this guy beyond what's there on the surface. The prosecutors from the original trilogy had some kind of edge to them. Even Edgeworth, come to think of it. Miles Edgeworth was the most focused on just doing his job of the three, but even then he had the backstory that tortured him to the present day and caused him to be a prosecutor to begin with. And then Franziska von Karma was out for revenge on Edgeworth by proving she could beat Mr. Wright, and Godot had a personal vendetta against Mr. Phoenix Trite as well. With Clavier returning because Kristoff got arrested, you'd expect this to be more of the same, especially since he gives Apollo a nickname pretty early on. But the twist is that Clavier Gavin isn't up for any of that melodrama. He's a serious prosecutor because that's his job and he takes everything he does seriously. No games to it besides that. He's still plenty crafty, like how in Case 3 he just lets the defense argue that the defendant, Maki Tobaye, is blind and therefore couldn't be the killer only to reveal that his blind status was a marketing thing. He can see just fine and withheld that info. And there are plenty of back and forth objection scenes between Apollo and Clavier, but pay attention to how this one from Turnabout Corner ends. Objection! Objection! He just cedes to the defense's point. 
Like I said, he's not up to any shenanigans, nor is he out to prove anything beyond the defendant guilty. And in Case 3, Apollo and Trucy even take a visit to Clavier's office where he's entirely nice to them. He even pays a visit to the Right Anything Agency. It turns out that Clavier making fun of Apollo's forehead is actually because he likes Apollo and finds him a breath of fresh air compared to other defense attorneys. The point is, such a laid-back prosecutor is in and of itself a refreshing change of pace. But it being the guy who is the multi-platinum hit rock star with a conceivable motive for revenge on Apollo makes him all the more interesting since you'd expect him to be the most outlandish yet. Apollo and Clavier's dynamic continues in Case 3, Turnabout Serenade, where he gave Apollo and Trucy tickets to his concert for 20% off. What a guy. As you can probably predict, a murder takes place and Apollo defends the accused and Clavier prosecutes. Case 3 is definitely my least favorite one in the game to actually play, and that's because it can be a bit dry at times. While playing, I realized why. The reason, to me at least, is because this game is not as funny as any of the trilogy games. I mean, the witnesses are certainly goofy in this game, but not as much as in the other games. The prosecution is also more relaxed, two of the defendants barely speak, and the killers are much more serious as characters. So you won't get a case like Recipe for Turnabout where the witnesses are outrageous, the scenarios are comedic as a result, the prosecution is piling on the antagonism, and the killer is as colorful as Furio Tigre. This game is also a lot more straight-faced throughout its runtime, which was clear when playing Turnabout Serenade, and the case took me over four hours to beat. That, and it does have some issues, like how many times you flash back to the victim's death, which really would have killed the pace in the DS original where you couldn't skip text. Then you also have to watch the tape from the guitar's serenade performance maybe a dozen times, and it gets pretty old as I started to check my email on Twitter when these parts came up. But that is certainly not to say this case is valueless. In terms of gameplay, I thought using the mixing board and listening to the music to spot issues was pretty unique. The music in this game in general is immaculate. The instrumentation is some of the best I've ever heard from a DS game, to where I think it makes sense the games would continue using this game's soundtrack again in later games, because it just sounds really good as is. With this being a music-themed case, I thought this was a good time to mention that. And despite what I just said about it being kind of dry, I thought the characters in this case, like the amnesiac songstress, Lemirwa, were perfectly likable, and in this case, we get to see Clavier Gavin both in his element on stage, but also see how he can lose his cool backstage over the slightest error in the show. I picked up on that because I thought the game was going to lead to Clavier's cool demeanor being shaken when his bandmate Darian Crescent was accused of being the killer, only for him to just accept that and act accordingly when the evidence makes that a likely scenario. It just further added to my belief that Clavier is one of the most interesting Ace Attorney prosecutors. But anyway, the game's whole story really starts to come together in the final episode, Case 4, Turnabout Succession. In the background of Cases 2 and 3, Phoenix Wright was working on a master plan and it's come to fruition. Phoenix has realized that the current legal system is not sustainable and needs a change and has been petitioning for an overhaul to its function and is using this new case as a trial run for the new system with Apollo and Trucy representing a girl named Vera Misham who's accused of poisoning her father, Drew Misham, and Clavier Gavin is prosecuting. The way the Ace Attorney series has worked thus far is that the defense and the prosecution present evidence and the judge will decide if the defendant is guilty or innocent, and in this model, evidence is everything. The new system is called the Jurist System, where six people from the public work with the judge to analyze the case and come to a verdict on guilty or not guilty. Suppose you know about this game's development history, and in that case, you'd know this was written this way because at the time, Japan was revitalizing a system very similar to that called the Lay Judge Trial, where people were chosen to work alongside judges for much the same purpose. Because of that ongoing discourse, it found its way into Apollo Justice. It's not a direct one-to-one -one parallel because the legal world of Ace Attorney was never a direct one-to-one -one parallel of any one criminal justice system, but having said that, you could look at Apollo Justice Ace Attorney itself as a piece of political messaging from the time, but I don't think that's a bad thing to begin with, and simultaneously, I think this story holds up pretty strong on its merit alone, even if you have absolutely no idea about what I just said, because it all goes back to what I was saying earlier in the script, when I spoke about Apollo Justice doing a more serious interrogation of the entire legal system these games have than any of the previous ones ever set out to do. Vera Misham is poisoned on the stand by the nail polish she had on, and when she's rushed to the hospital, the player gets a little backstory in the case by letting us play Phoenix's final trial from seven years ago. Mr. Wright faced off against a rookie Clavier Gavin and had to defend Zach Grammaray when he's accused of killing his mentor, Magna Fee. This is when Phoenix first meets Trucy, who's actually Zach's daughter. There are a number of great things about this part of the game, and I'll try to list all the ones I took notice of while playing. This trial beautifully plays with your nostalgia. I mean, we've been playing as Apollo for the last three and a half cases with a new courtroom and this game's new court suite, but then we get back in the shoes of Phoenix Wright, and the trial takes place in the courtroom from the trilogy, and Detective Gumshoe returns to make a cameo while the music is all returning pieces from the first Ace Attorney. You aren't just playing as the basic Phoenix Wright, though. It's a post-trilogy Wright, and that he's way more confident and capable. I mean, he took this case the night before the trial, and he's crushing it throughout. Also, not taking Clavier seriously, because by this point, he's seen countless eccentric prosecuting prodigies, and it's not phasing him anymore. 
All that should be fun, but like Turnabout Beginnings from Trials and Tribulations, the whole trial is packed with this dramatic irony, as you know every contradiction you solve will lead to Phoenix Wright presenting the piece of forged evidence and losing his legal career over it. This plotline feels the most like a commentary on the asinine legal standards the Ace Attorney series has used thus far. I mean, Phoenix got into this position because Trucy, an eight-year-old, handed him a piece of paper and said someone said to give it to him, and when he uses it in the trial, Clavier knew it was fake evidence and exposed it. Something like this was bound to happen sooner or later because evidence being handled like this has happened an uncountable amount of times in the Ace Attorney series. Like in Turnabout Sisters when Mr. Wright finds the wiretap in April May's hotel room and presents it in court when no one else saw it. Or in Rise from the Ashes when Phoenix, Emma, and Gumshoe just investigate the chief's office and present the findings in court. The evidence law presented in that case claimed this was legitimate as long as connection to the current trial could be proved. The prosecution can do this too, as Farewell My Turnabout saw Edgeworth pay a visit to the defendant's home and found the spy cam. These rules are something you get used to when you play the trilogy, but if you really stop and think about it, this system is fraud waiting to happen on a massive scale, and here's an example of how. But in the world of Ace Attorney, it also makes perfect sense because the games have a rule where investigations need to be completed in three days so the trial can happen as quickly as possible. And as has been seen numerous times in the games, rushed investigations are what follows leading to evidence being uncovered by both sides mid-trial. I'm just saying that the plot of Apollo Justice revolves around how broken such a system actually would be. As a result of the evidence is everything rule, so many killers in the original trilogy were only caught because of a one in a million mistake or just outright trickery, like when Phoenix lies about the medicine bottle to Furio Tigre to get him to admit he knew what the poison bottle actually looked like. This is exactly what Phoenix had to do in turn about Trump as well to catch Christoph Gavin. The legal system of Ace Attorney was in need of a serious change. Apollo really resented Phoenix after Case 1 because he thought it was gross that Mr. Wright would knowingly trick everyone to get Kristoff to screw up and reveal he had to be the true killer. But then, Case 3 shines a light on how in this world, sometimes that's the only option. Phoenix tells Apollo that to catch a detective like Darian Crescend, evidence won't be good enough, and Apollo quickly realizes that this is a legal system that protects fraudsters and other criminals, realizing then maybe Mr. Wright was correct after all, leading to Case 4 where Apollo's role in Phoenix's master plan is revealed. The final investigation segment of the game is Phoenix's journey over the seven years to try and find out what really happened during the case that cost him his attorney's badge. Presented to the jurists like a simulated game experience where we get to play around with Phoenix's Magatama for old time's sake. You get to see many sides of Phoenix in this segment, reinforcing my feeling that this version of Wright is probably my favorite in the series. After losing his badge, he becomes pretty no-nonsense in his pursuit of the truth and is cool, calm, and confident while doing so. Then he's also pretty goofy when he's not working, and I find that really entertaining. My favorite part is the scene in the past, after the trial, when Phoenix realizes that Trucy has no other relatives since the defendant escaped the courtroom and used Trucy to help him do it. Phoenix just offers to take her in even when he's at a career low point because that is the only right thing to do in this circumstance and they become a found family within minutes. The dynamic they have is pretty adorable, and I'm glad the later games maintained that even when Wright becomes an attorney again. Though, I admit I'm a sucker for the trope. But anyway, Phoenix discovers that Christoph Gavin is behind everything and calculated this master plan to expose the truth and overhaul the legal system with jurists who can use common sense to come to a verdict, even when the evidence isn't absolutely decisive. Apollo was the last piece of the plan as he needed him there to help him turn the tables in Case 1 and now finish the job in Case 4 as Apollo proves Christoph has a motive to kill and silence the people involved in his forgery, and Clavier even throws fuel into the fire by saying that he was the one who told Clavier about the forged evidence from seven years ago. Sure, the evidence isn't absolute, but he's guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, and that is enough for the jurists. Kristoff being the perfect villain for this game because he was the kind of person who was able to mastermind his way through the old system as he knew the laws in and out and how to dodge detection within that system. Thus, the new system is something he has no control over, which makes Kristoff mighty upset. Clavier and the judge reflecting on how the law does have contradictions and loopholes, but it grows through trials and tribulations and evolves to meet the challenges of a new day, which Kristoff thinks is an insult to the courts. The final note of the character being kind of a chilling one. But in the end, all is right for the world as Vera recovers and Kristoff is exposed. Apollo knowing that his story has only just begun and he's willing to fight for truth and justice. Also, the game ends on the note of Phoenix talking to Trucy's long-lost mother and there's a reveal that Apollo and Trucy are half-siblings and that until the time comes to reveal that knowledge, he'll keep watching over both of them. It's a really sweet ending that ties up a lot of stuff and leaves plenty of room for more story in the future. 
but that's besides the point. I titled this video In Defense of Apollo Justice because of the fact that I might not believe that this game has the comedic heights of the original trilogy, nor is it as action-packed as those games were at times. I mean, compare the plot beats of Farewell My Turnabout or Bridge to the Turnabout to a final case like Turnabout Succession and you'll see what I mean. There's no assassin or kidnapping ransom plot or burning bridge with a supposedly flying victim or exercising a demon on the stand or any of that stuff in this game. But I think the strength of Apollo Justice lies not in its attempt to outdo the trilogy on those elements because I don't think it was. I think this game's story's greatest strength is how it tells a story across four cases about the Ace Attorney legal system using characters both old and new to do it, attempting to forge something new for the series going forward. Whether or not that goal has aged well isn't really relevant to the discussion of why I like Apollo Justice, and can even enjoy the parts that are more dry as a part of the larger package since I really like the overarching story and love the new cast of characters and what the game had to say. It's not my favorite Ace Attorney, but I still love it nevertheless and hope this video proved why that is throughout the last 20 or so minutes. But that's just about all the time we have for today, so I hope you all liked the video. The response to the Phoenix Wright Trilogy one I did last year was so positive that I was like, yeah, I'm gonna keep doing Ace Attorney videos because I think it's pretty fun to talk about. Don't know when I'll have another one, but I'm confident it'll happen eventually. But until that time comes, I'll say what I always do. If you made it this far into the video, I thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.